Welcome. I'm Kinetic Symphony. I hunt down and report on weird and true mysterious stories, from glitches to the paranormal. Would you like even more content? Here's my Patreon. Now onto the stories. Case file number 1196, written by Poundtown. I witness my nephew's resurrection. I always tried to convince myself that this was just my imagination going wild in a time of crisis. When my nephew was about four years old, we were at a picnic for a family reunion type thing at my uncle's house. In their backyard, they had this totally bitchin' treehouse that had a slide that went over a small creek. The treehouse was about 30 feet off the ground. It was the middle of summer and the water had dried up in the creek leaving only exposed rocks. I guess more like small boulders. They were about 3 feet in diameter, pretty solid. My nephew and the other kids were playing in the treehouse, all taking turns going down the slide and no one was really paying attention. How it happened is still truly not known, but we do know that somehow, my nephew fell off the slide at the highest point and fell head first into the dried up creek bed. The sound was the first thing everyone noticed. It sounded like a gunshot, this extremely loud cracking. Everyone at the picnic was silent at this point. I vividly remember running over to the creek to see what had happened, and every time I think about this day, I get the same image in my head. I remember seeing him laying on the flat rock, blood everywhere and he's not moving. It's a really graphic image I get, basically his head is caved in. This thought is always followed by something I can only describe as static, if that makes sense. I don't remember what really happened but my next memory is of my nephew laying on a bench, no blood, completely awake but crying really loudly. An ambulance came and took him to the hospital and he only ended up with a concussion and some scratches and bruises. It still sticks with me though. I know what I saw and I can't explain why I saw it. It feels like a memory but it's not. I've never been a religious person and I'm still not into organized religion but I stopped being an atheist after that day. Case notes file 1196. I witnessed my nephew's resurrection. Tree houses, yes. <laughs> my dad built me a tree house when I was 10 or 11-ish. I helped him a bit. It wasn't extravagant, but we did have a, sw a tire swing as well. So many good memories in that place, though not over a creek or anything dangerous, just over grass, so if I fell down, <laughs> it was fine. The uh, tree house in this story does seem rather dangerous. Here's a random thought. What if extreme emotional distress at an event can cause a soul to jump to a neighboring universe? Basically, quantum immortality, but it not initiated from physical body death, instead, from emotional death. Your mind in that universe couldn't handle it. No idea if that's the case, and if it is, it's much more rare. But I could see that happening. Why not? Why is it only physical death what matters? Maybe emotional trauma does matter too, and you go to a new universe, and in that one, this terrible tragedy didn't actually occur, and your nephew didn't die. He's still alive, just with some scrapes and bruises. Case file number 1197, written by TL7LMT. The Power of Pure Love. This is my first memory. I was a toddler, and my dad and I drove into town. First, this was amazing because I come from a large family and my dad works six days a week. None of us ever got alone time with dad. So right off, this was special, a happy occasion for me. I remember sliding across the seat a bit when we went around curves. This was in the days long before mandatory car seats or even seat belts. So we get to the store. My dad sets me down on the floor. I toddled over to some shelves and I can remember looking down at my chubby knees and thinking, huh, it's incredible that I can get around on these two legs and have my hands free to touch stuff. I was really, really young. I looked back at my dad, who was talking to some guy in a green apron, and they both smiled at me, so reassured. I kept exploring. Then I saw my very first black person. She was probably about 40, with a dusty old dress and headscarf, really run-down shoes, and a sullen, older child walking behind her. I was fascinated, so I toddled after her, got her attention, and lifted my arms up to be picked up. She looked around, so I did too. Dad was nodding his head at her, so she picked me up. She had the most beautiful colored skin and it was so soft. I was stroking her face in awe of it when I noticed tears were trickling down her face. Somehow I knew she suffered because of her beautiful skin 
and I laid my head over her chest and patted her shoulder with my hand. In my baby talk, I told her that it would be okay, that when she returned to her real home, heaven, she would be joyful and at peace and all her suffering would be rewarded with angel songs and love. I told her that when she got home, no one would care about the color of her skin. I mean, I saw all of this in my mind and I was explaining this to her and she just held me and let me coo at her. Eventually, she let me down, and I toddled happily over to Dad, who picked me up and took us back home. Years later, I asked my mom how old I was when I learned to walk, and she proudly stated that all her kids were walking by the age of one year old. Dad remembered this day too. He was amazed that I remembered it. I did not begin any formal religious training until I was five years old, so I had no conception of religion. I certainly knew nothing about racial disparity, at that point, we didn't even have a TV. This was in western New York about 1958. More cows than people where I lived. It's not a creepy story, but I can't explain how I knew what I knew that day. I was just too young to know any of it. Case notes are file 1197. The Power of Pure Love. So I agree, it's not a creepy story. It's a beautiful story. I feel like this kind of thing broadcasted worldwide can just move hearts, minds, and souls, don't you? You were young, but your soul was not, and was tethered to all the real information out there. Now, as far as religion, what heaven really represents, it's hard to say. To me, it's the knowledge that this woman was in pain for something out of her control, and just being there for her as a kid. And, you know, everyone says that kids are so honest, and they typically are. They don't have the filter that adults have. So, I think it meant a lot to her in that moment, just as her as an individual. What more can you ask from a kid, you know, or from anyone? I love this story. Creepy file number 100, written by Viva22. Tuxedo-clad stranger leaves girl bewildered. One time, when I was walking home from campus late at night, around 2 a.m., my university has dorms and I've been visiting a friend, and a kind of nice-looking car drove up on the sidewalk next to me. Now, considering the fact that I am not a very large girl, I thought I was about to have to fight off a kidnapper. So this guy steps out of the driver's side of the car in a full tuxedo and walks up to me and goes, Miss, I just wanted to tell you that you look beautiful tonight. Then he promptly got back in his car and drove away. I never really understood what happened, but thanks for the compliment. Case notes for the creepy file number 100. A tuxedo-clad stranger leaves girl bewildered. That's one of the more randomly wholesome and accidentally creepy events I've ever read. Going with my gut, it may have been a somewhat wealthy man with poor social skills that didn't realize how strange approaching a woman on the street at 2am was. Doesn't seem like anything else happened, so I'll go with that. But yeah, very odd. Definitely compliment random people, it's, it's nice, people appreciate it, and spread the cheer, but just don't do it to women at 2am, or really a guy either, I would be creeped out too if some, <laughs> some person just gave me a compliment while I'm walking at 2am. Okay, <laughs> you don't want to freak people out and think they're going to get robbed or something. And now time for the quote of the day. A perfect parent is a person with excellent child rearing theories and no actual children. Dave Berry. I just like this quote because I think I was a really good kid growing up, thinking on my memories and what my mom said, but even then I was still kind of a rascal, you know, so full of energy. Even if you're a good kid that doesn't like just randomly break rules or hit people or speak out or anything like that. I mean, I, I would be picky with food, I guess. I, I can only imagine how much energy it takes to raise a kid in just the, those first two years where you get no sleep. I need my sleep. So that's going to be an interesting experience <laughs> whenever I do have kids. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> like the video, subscribe, hit the bell. Kinetic Symphony, signing off.